On this Thursday night, we told you about the lives lost after the Danforth shooting. Tonight, an exclusive look at one of the lives forever changed. When gunfire rang out, Danielle Kane and her boyfriend ran to help a victim, only to be shot herself. Tonight, she's in the ICU. Her fight to recover and the doctor who saved her life. Also tonight, what's behind Facebook's record stock collapse? And the new voice of Vancouver Transit, the tweet that convinced Seth Rogen to bring his comedy to SkyTrain. This is The National. The day after the Danforth attack, we heard Toronto's police chief describe some of the wounded as having life-altering injuries. Danielle Kane is one of those people. Just 31 years old, on Sunday she was enjoying a night out. Now she's waiting for another operation and facing the possibility she may never walk again. For the first time tonight, her family is sharing her story with the National. This is, today is my first time here. Byron Abelo says he still finds it difficult to process what happened at this restaurant Sunday night. His cousin, Daniel Kane, and her boyfriend, Jerry Pinkston, were having dinner when they heard someone had been shot. Pinkston, an emergency room nurse, went out a side door to help. Kane, a nursing student, was right behind. That's when they came face to face with the shooter who was walking by. He turned, um, he made eye contact with Jerry, and um, Jerry said he doesn't remember seeing a gun, but he remembers hearing a sound, a click or something, and then seeing that him lift his arms towards him. Uh, and Jerry was able to duck out of the way uh, behind some ta patio tables. And that, I think, was the moment where Danny came through the door and just kind of walked into uh, that situation. Now, Abelo says it's not clear if his cousin will walk again. She was hit in the spine by a bullet. And that's just one of her challenges as she remains at St. Michael's Hospital in intensive care. The bullet ruptured her stomach and her uh, diaphragm. And some of the fluids from her stomach were getting into her abdomen. Um, so as we speak right now, her abdomen is still open. And they've done a couple of surgeries and procedures, procedures to uh, wash it out, make sure it's clean. Uh, and if all the things go well, tomorrow morning she'll uh, they'll be able to close, close it up. And then that's, that's the first big hurdle for her, is to heal from that, uh, which should um, take about six weeks, is what I've heard. And then there's the injury to her spine. Not life-threatening, but almost certainly life-changing. Out of our family and out of our cousins, like, Danielle is, like, she's that spark plug. She's, like, she's a smile, and she's bright and colorful uh, and strong and opinionated. And um, to to think that she might not be able to do the things that she loves to do, like dance and be athletic and go on hikes and stuff, that uh, it just is tragic. Abelos was asked by Danielle's family to speak publicly, but he says they know they're not the only ones struggling. This whole community is grieving. Two families have lost daughters, and, and, uh, and there are many sur other survivors uh, who have to deal with this fallout from this um, senseless and tragic event. And so Danielle's family continues to support her at her hospital bedside and launching a GoFundMe campaign for what will be a long road to recovery. And later tonight, we'll hear from one of the people who helped save Kane's life along with several other victims, Dr. Najma Ahmed at St. Michael's Hospital here in Toronto. And I want to play you a small excerpt from that conversation where she says that some of the survivors still have a long road ahead. I think there tends to be a focus uh, for the public and, you know, for the media about for in, in, in intensity and focus in the first many days about uh, how this happened and what the, you know, how many people survived and who didn't survive. But for patients who, are, uh, who suffer trauma, be it from a motor vehicle crash or a motor motorcycle accident or, or a gunshot wound, uh, they are going to be in the hospital for months, months. And then they require rehabilitation for months and months. They're often young people, as I've outlined, but it changes their life and they're never the same. And it's never the same for the family. The, the physical burden of injury is huge, uh, not to mention the psychological burden. Of so you'll hear more of my conversation with Dr. Ahmed in about 30 minutes. And Andrew, she describes how that night unfolded and what was going through her mind when at home she got the call to respond.
Yeah, I mean, from her point of view, it must be one of those things that you, you prepare for but never fully expect. And, and, you know, it wasn't just the number of victims, she said, but, but she also talks about the realization as she was doing her work that, that someone targeted these victims, many of them so young in an act, so senseless. Mm. And there's lots more to come on the program here tonight. Facebook has suffered a record loss on the stock market. And as you'll hear from our business reporter, Jacqueline Hansen, the loss of confidence may be the bigger blow. And tonight, another deadline for the U.S. government to reunite separated children. But it's unclear just how many kids have been returned to their parents. First, though, a serious criminal charge laid against a Toronto teacher after one of his students died on a field trip. That the teacher could be held responsible in that way may be unprecedented. But as Nicole Ireland explains, much has come to light in the year since a school canoe trip ended in tragedy. What was supposed to be an adventure in the outdoors for Toronto high school students turned into a desperate search operation. It ended with divers finding the body of 15-year-old Jeremiah Perry. He drowned while swimming in Big Trout Lake at Algonquin Park. Ontario Provincial Police launched an investigation and today announced they were charging Nicholas Mills, a teacher from Jeremiah's high school who organized and supervised the trip, with criminal negligence causing death. The Toronto District School Board says Mills has been on home assignment since the accident happened. We continue to be very troubled by the fact that it would, it would appear that our safety requirements were not followed on this trip over a year ago. Those safety requirements included a swim test. At the time, the board said every student who went on the camping trip had to have passed it. It turned out half of them, including Jeremiah, failed it. This Toronto defence lawyer says he's never seen a teacher face a charge like this after an accident on a school trip. In a circumstance, we were going on a, on, on a camping trip to uh, another part of the province without the parents and basically the only adult supervisors are going to be the teachers for a, per for a few days or a few nights. I can certainly see, I, I'd be surprised if the court doesn't find that the, par the teachers are pretty much stepping into the role of the parents in those circumstances. Joshua Anderson, Jeremiah's father, says the charge is warranted. In a statement today, he said, although nothing that happens now can bring back Jeremiah or take away the pain of losing him, we hope that having the case proceed through the criminal justice system will be one important step in ensuring that a tragedy like this never happens again on a school trip. To make sure it doesn't, the school board says it now requires parents to acknowledge they've seen the results of their children's swim tests. And if they don't pass, they don't go on field trips involving water. Nicole Ireland, CBC News, Toronto. So this is a case that is important for a number of reasons, but it also raises a big question that other teachers will have to answer for themselves. We asked a union rep for his thoughts. So I suspect that teachers will be assessing their own comfort level with those kind of risks right now. I hope it doesn't have a chilling effect, but rather just an effect of making sure that both the employer and the teacher involved are fully aware of the responsibilities and the processes and, and just a stricter adherence to them and an insurance that they're, they're rigid and well followed is what I hope for, but there could be a chilling effect. And he says he also hopes changes are made at the school board level to look over and improve the rules around field trips and to keep students safe. Now to the worst day of trading for one of the world's biggest companies. Facebook set a record for the most money lost in a single day on Wall Street. A huge chunk, 19% of its market value disappeared. We're talking more than $100 billion, way more than the GDP of some small countries. So let's bring in our business reporter, Jacqueline Hansen, who's been looking into uh, why. Let's begin mm. with what happened today. Well, yeah, I mean, up until today, it was a bit of a surprise today when we saw this drop, because up until today, Facebook's growth seemed practically unstoppable. But we did see that that seems to be not the case anymore. Um, in the company's conference call yesterday, Mark Zuckerberg was pretty frank about the company's weak spots. We're investing so much in security that it will significantly impact our profitability. We're starting to see that this quarter. Facebook says it can't keep up its rapid growth while it spends more money on privacy and security. We will continue to invest heavily in security and privacy because we have a responsibility to keep people safe. 
and it's being forced to by new rules in the European Union to protect consumer privacy. That's already slowing advertising growth there. But it was Facebook's plan to shift ads from news feeds to stories, a newer feature of photos and videos that last just 24 hours, that made some analysts skeptical. There's an argument to be made that they're switching to stories, they're switching away from the really successful ad model because the other ad model was failing with respect to security. And that means that they aren't being proactive, they actually are being reactive, and they don't necessarily have a plan. They don't know if it's going to work. Plus, it has another potential problem. Users aren't signing up at the rates they used to. And this expert points to one possible reason. There's an entire younger uh, generation, younger demographic, that's not using the, the platform. Then there's the Cambridge Analytica data scandal, lingering privacy concerns, and the spread of fake news, all likely testing users' trust. But will they leave? Because it is so big, I don't think it's going to be any kind of immediate drop-off that we see. But could this be the beginning of a slow uh, decline for the platform? I think that there's no doubt that that's the case. So what we saw today was investors reacting to some pretty big concerns. The cost of privacy rules in the EU, it's slowing user and revenue growth, and a warning that profit will likely be squeezed for quarters, if not years to come. But despite all that, Ian, this is, as you said, still one of the most valuable tech companies in the world. But what it lost today, along with that drop in its market value, was uh, investors, many investors' confidence in the company. And the numbers are so big, they're kind of hard to grasp. Thank you very much, Jacqueline. You're welcome. Facebook also revealed in the earnings report that it's losing users in Europe, but for the company's bottom line, stalling user growth in the United States and Canada is far scarier. Let's show you what we mean. Facebook makes an average of nearly $6 of revenue per person. That's globally, but let's break it down by region. The average value of a European user was close to $9, but an American or Canadian user, almost $26. The big difference is that advertisers, where almost all of Facebook's revenue comes from, see users in the U.S. and Canada as more affluent. So that's what you're worth to Facebook. What about what Facebook is worth to Mark Zuckerberg? While today's stock drop hit his personal stake as well, his net worth losing close to $16 billion. But he's still doing just fine, worth about $67 billion. That's according to Forbes. Well, the U.S. government scrambled today to reunite migrant children with their families. They were separated under the Trump administration's zero-tolerance policy for people trying to slip across the border. And a judge ordered the government to fix that by today. It says mission accomplished, but critics aren't so sure. Now, today's deadline was to bring children five and over back together with their families. The Justice Department says around 1,800 of them have been reunited with their parents or released to relatives or other sponsors, but there are still hundreds of children in government custody. So, can the Trump administration call this a win, or did today's scramble reveal a mess that defies accountability? It's a tricky question that we asked Paul Hunter to take on. Outside a social services center in New York today and a kind of chaos amid rushed efforts to reunite families forcibly separated at the U.S.-Mexico border. Here, children taken from their parents by the U.S. government were part of a last-minute court-ordered push to be taken back to their parents by today, but it's unclear how many made it or where they ended up. <laughs> Though there's been evidence lately of tearfully happy reunions, critics underline, hold your applause. It doesn't excuse what the government did, but we are going to be enormously pleased that children are in their parents' arms. Indeed, under a directive by the Trump administration earlier this year, anyone caught crossing into the U.S. illegally, even those fleeing strife, were to be federally prosecuted. That meant cages in detention centers in Texas and children taken from their parents. Let the children go! Public outcry was fierce, go. and the backlash led to a California judge ordering the government to reunite the families. The government says it's made great progress, but acknowledges it's lost track of some parents, and more than 400 other parents have already been deported without their children. It's unclear how or even if they'll ever be reunited. Return the kids! 
in Washington today. Children and other demonstrators march toward Capitol Hill to press the U.S. government to find a way to make sure all families are eventually reunited. Even as the Trump administration defended its position that U.S. immigration policy must be hardened. You do not get to come to America unlawfully. Let's just make that clear. This system is built on uh, making your application and waiting your turn. Indeed, even the tearful reunions come with a caveat. Deportation hearings now await for most. And so, Paul, the deadline has come and gone, and there are still kids in custody. So what now? Yeah, well, good question. No one knows. Um, it's kind of uncharted territory. It is a court order, so consequences are possible. Uh, for example, government officials could be fined or imprisoned. Um, that said, it's much more likely that a judge would see good faith, that the government has been trying to get this done on time and allow some leeway. Still, the whole idea of the deadline was to get it done. So there likely wouldn't be too much wiggle room. But, you know, keep in mind, this is a problem entirely of the U.S. government's own making. And in that it's also the government that's now deported those 400-plus parents without their kids already, your guess is as good as anyone's, as I say, how they'll ever get reunited. The Washington Post today wrote a particularly scathing editorial about all of it, calling the whole episode a contemptuous, cruel, noxious humanitarian outrage. So it's clear that regardless of any penalty by the courts, if any, the Trump administration has already paid a stiff price in the public eye for its approach on this. Okay, thanks, Paul. And some of the other developing stories we are tracking tonight include an update from authorities in Greece. They think this week's deadly fire may have been started deliberately. Here's a look from earlier today at what's left in a coastal town near Athens after being ravaged by wildfire. 82 people are dead. 187 others were hurt, including more than 20 children. Authorities say they suspect arson because satellite images and ground inspections suggest the fire broke out in multiple places in a relatively short time frame. The Pakistani government participated in the election today. As former cricket star Imran Khan claiming victory today in Pakistan's general election. We're still waiting on final results, so we don't know yet if his party will get a majority or be forced to form a coalition. But Khan's rivals have already rejected the outcome. They say the vote count was rigged. I do not expect to make any public comments about the case in Mr. Hogarth's position. It will become uh, clear uh, in due course. That is the lawyer for Headley's lead singer, Jacob Hogard, outside a Toronto courthouse today. Hogard was arrested Monday and charged with two counts of sexual assault and one count of sexual interference. His lawyer appeared in court on his behalf, but it was short. His case was put over until next month. Still ahead on The National, researchers have discovered mutated strains of HIV in Saskatchewan that makes AIDS develop faster. We'll take you through the new study. Plus, the resource crisis facing RCMP investigators. Why a decision to close forensics labs is putting prosecutions at risk. And how one tweet brought a famous Vancouver voice to the transit system. It's our moment of the day. So I suggested Seth Rogen just very casually online, and a lot of people agreed. Uh, any opportunity to enrich the lives of the Canadian people is an opportunity I will take. <laughs> There is a compelling new reason to get tested for HIV in Saskatchewan. Researchers have discovered mutated strains of the virus there, which can lead to faster developing AIDS-related illnesses. Olivia Stefanovic explains. I just couldn't believe it. My, heart, my life just flashed before me because I knew it was gonna be totally changed. Daryl Caldwell has been living with HIV for seven years. He comes from Cote First Nation in Saskatchewan, where HIV rates are 11 times higher than the national average. A lot of these people are covering up sexual trauma, so they turn their way to the bottle or to the needle. 80% of people who have HIV in the province are Indigenous. Caldwell is in hospital for other health reasons. 
He wants others to know people with the virus can live long, comfortable lives. Get tested is the number one thing I'm, I'm stressing out there. Today's study in the scientific journal AIDS underscores that. Researchers heard about an HIV mutation in Japan and went looking for it in Saskatchewan. They found it, especially but not only, in the indigenous population. We're all humans. We all share the same gene pool. The study found anyone with a mutation could rapidly develop AIDS-related illnesses, but that antiviral drugs work if the HIV is caught early. The medications that we have to treat HIV work equally well. Cookers. It's just the usual. Yeah. Water. Thank okay. You. There's filters and a container. Yeah. At this harm reduction agency in Regina, they exchange more than 6,000 needles each day to prevent the spread of HIV. Workers say more education is needed. We are still finding that people are not fully using these resources, and, and that's mainly because of a lack of awareness. HIV groups are pushing for more people to get tested, and Saskatchewan is spending an additional $600,000 this year for HIV medications. Olivia Stepanovich, CBC News, Regina. About 75,000 Canadians have HIV, but one in five don't know it, which makes transmitting the virus much more likely. In 2016, there were more than 2,300 new HIV infections. That's up more than 11% from the year before. And Saskatchewan has the highest diagnosis rate, more than double the national average. And Nova Scotia has seen 16 new HIV cases in the first six months of 2018. That's usually what the province sees in an entire year. Now, it's unclear what's caused the jump, but it's prompted the province to take steps. It's expanding access to pre-exposure prophylaxis, or PrEP. Jurisdictions that fund the medication have reported a 40% decrease in new HIV cases. And coming up on The National. The aviation world remembers a pioneer who made history. We will tell you the story of Mary Ellis. And my full interview with Dr. Najma Ahmed, she tells us what it was like in St. Michael's Hospital Sunday night as five of the victims were rushed there after the deadly shooting on the Danforth. The mood was very much serious. The mood was very much uh, get your head in the game. Uh, the mood was very much, let's, pull on, let's all pull in the same direction and make sure that we save as many lives and minimize uh, as much damage as we can. You want to be here to, to say that this isn't okay, and we're, but we're not scared. People in Toronto continue to visit and contribute to the growing memorial for victims of last Sunday's mass shooting on the Danforth. A march and vigil drew thousands of people last night, including Mayor John Tory and the Ontario Premier Doug Ford. The outpouring of support for the victims has been huge. Less well known are the stories of those who responded. I spoke with Dr. Najma Ahmed, a trauma surgeon at St. Michael's Hospital here in Toronto. She led one of the teams that worked through the night to save victims' lives. I met her in an operating room where we're required to wear scrubs over our clothes. In our conversation, she describes just how quickly the emergency response unfolded. Let's start with when you got the call. You were at home on Sunday night. What time did you get the call? I think, as I recall, I got the call um shortly after 10.20 or 10.30. So Dr. Lawless was the primary trauma surgeon on call and I got a text, uh, are you around multiple GSWs, multiple gunshot wounds? And I answered, yeah, I'm at home, text me if you need me. Five minutes later or less than five minutes later, actually the chief of critical care uh, called me on my phone and said there's been a code orange at the hospital. So code orange means that there's a catastrophe in the city, there's a mass casualty or some other emergency in the city. Uh, and so it's all hands on deck, means that nobody who's currently in the hospital can go home, even if their shift is over or whatever. That includes the porters, everybody stays put. We call in uh, backup teams uh, from home. So I live about 10 minutes from the hospital, so I, I got into my, my scrubs uh, and I drove into the hospital. And as I came down shooter, I could see there was lots of ambulances and lots of uh, police cars and I had a sense then it was gonna be a, a tough night and something uh, catastrophic had happened in the city. At what point did you get a clearer sense of how big it was? I didn't really get a clear sense of how big it was uh, for a few hours as, 
As I came in, I was told that Dr. Lawless was already in the operating room uh, performing surgery on uh, the first patient, and then there was uh, multiple other patients that I triaged and assessed uh, and realized that a second patient needed to go emergently to the operating room. So we rushed that patient upstairs. We got the, the, the OR was on standby, as is, as, the, as is the case for a mass casualty situation. So we got started almost immediately. Uh, and I don't think it was until about uh, 4 o'clock in the morning, really, that I got a clear sense of uh, the scale of what had happened, how many patients had gone to which hospitals, how many patients required surgery, uh, and that sort of stuff. What was the mood inside here? If I'd been able to walk around where you were walking around that night? I think the mood was very much serious. The mood was very much uh, get your head in the game. Uh, the mood was very much let's, pull on, let's all pull in the same direction and make sure that we save as many lives and minimize uh, as much damage as we can. And every single person that I saw that night, I saw that in their eyes. I mean, for people on the street in the Danforth, there were so many questions, there was so much uncertainty, it was all so unsettling, a sense of unease. Was there any of that here, or was there a point at which that kind of seeped into here as well? I think there was a sense of shock and a sense of this can't happen here, and how did this happen? We're Toronto, we're Canada, this does not happen here. For sure, that, that was seeping into everyone's consciousness as the hours rolled by. In the moment, I think we were all very much focused on the job that we had to do right then. Uh, and since then, of course, there has been a lot of dismay and concern about how this could have happened and what we're going to do about it. Was there anything different when you were in the OR that night and, and the next day, given the nature of this event? I think as the, as the information was trickling in, you come in, you know what you have to do, you get very laser focused, you do what you have to do. You stand over the patient and you, you're organizing your team and you fix injuries. Um, I think because of the circumstances, because it was in the heart of the city, and because the loss of life has been so tragic and at such an innocent age, I think I, st I got a sense that this was different. That for me was, you know, it was kind of crushing, kind of soul crushing when that information started trickling into the operating rooms as we were operating and treating patients as the night and the next days went by. Um, we, you know, we see a loss of life, but this kind of mass casualty um, gunman thing in the heart of the city is, is not something that we're accustomed to in a city like Toronto. I normally wouldn't in an interview ask somebody a question that involves their religion, but uh, Mohammed Leela, a reporter who used to work for CBC, who's Muslim, tweeted that, that the gunman was Muslim, but so too was one of the key doctors, the acting, one of the acting directors at, at St. Michael's Hospital. And you saw that tweet and you, you were touched by it. Yeah, that tweet was brought to my attention. Um, or well, that Facebook post was brought to my attention. And I was, I was somewhat touched by it. And I, you know, it's out there, so perhaps it's worth talking about. I guess I would say that you know, every day, millions and billions of people on planet Earth get up, uh, regardless of their faith or their religion, or even if they don't have faith in a god, get up and, uh, every day and go about their business and try and make the world a better place. And I'm just one of those billions of people. I just happened to be in the business of saving lives. And that night, my job was to save these lives. A lot of people in Toronto have done a lot of thinking over the last few days, and they've wondered, is their city safe? Has their city changed? What can they do to make their city better? Have you had any moments like that? For sure. We've had a lot of conversations like that at St. Michael's Hospital. Uh, I think our city has changed. For sure, something like this uh, affects the way we think about our community and about our city. Um, I don't think it'll ever be go back to being the same. Uh, and what can be done about it is a very important question. And what can be done about it is, I think we have to think very uh, deliberately and carefully about uh, gun safety legislation and firearm legislation in our country. Uh, because I, I personally believe it's a slippery slope unless we get a a handle on it now, we're going to be in a place that we maybe don't want to be in in the decades to come. There were five victims taken to St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto where Dr. Ahmed works. Three of them required surgery and she took part in all three of those operations. You can find more on the exclusive stories we brought you from the Danforth tonight on our Instagram page at CBC The National. 
Before we go to break, we do want to show you the story of another remarkable woman. British Prime Minister Theresa May is among those paying tribute today to Mary Ellis, a trailblazing aviator. She's died at the age of 101 after long being one of the few surviving female pilots from the Second World War. Ellis was on hand this spring to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Royal Air Force, an organization she predated by one year. During the war, she joined the Air Transport Auxiliary, delivering aircraft from the factories to the front lines. At first, women were trusted only with trainers and transport planes, but a labor shortage meant she was soon flying Spitfires, Wellingtons, and dozens of other warplanes. She recalled how one ground crew refused to believe a woman had delivered their new bomber. I said, I am the pilot. And they didn't believe me. And they actually went in the airplane and searched it to find a pilot. And they came back and said, there's nobody there, you must be. Ellis and her colleagues were the first women to receive equal pay from the British government for doing the same work as men. After the war, Ellis moved to the Isle of Wight, where she managed the local airport for 20 years and she married a pilot. She said she never forgot the exhilarating freedom of flight. Up in the air on your own, and you can do whatever you like. You know, I flew 400 Spitfires, and occasionally I would take one up and go and play with the clouds, which was so delightful and lovely. Oh, I can't tell you how wonderful it was. Johnny's back. Fufu. Yeah, fufu. I was like, who's fufu? <laughs> Lots of laughs. My cheeks are sore. Loyal fans. He was off the floral Richter right scale. Can't get enough. I do not look like that. Johnny Suja. Good job, Johnny. More like Benny Hula. <laughs> crazy. <laughs> okay. Still crazy. Still standing. Awesome. I don't know how he does that. Thanks so much. Still standing. Returns September 18th on CBC. Part of the Tuesday night comedy lineup. Welcome back. On The National Tonight, look at that. Menacing-looking clouds rolling over the Toronto skyline. It got people buzzing on social media with lots of folks sharing photos as the city suddenly got dark. But it was surrounding areas that took the brunt of the storm. That is absolutely crazy. Few in southern Ontario escaped the sudden downpours of hail, ice pellets the size of nickels at times. Marble-sized hail right now. Really big wind. And it wasn't just hail. The storm also brought strong winds, thunder, lightning, and heavy rain. And what made it all the more jarring, yes, there was ice, but it was also hot, with the Humidex making temperatures feel like the mid-30s. Another project by Quebec director Robert Lepage has been cancelled following allegations of cultural appropriation. Members of the Indigenous community had criticized a play called Kanata for its lack of meaningful involvement of Indigenous people. In a statement, Lepage's company said it made the decision after American co-producers withdrew their support. You may recall earlier this month, the Montreal Jazz Festival dropped another Lepage production. That show, too, was criticized for cultural appropriation. I just want to say I'm thankful to the DA and the judge for allowing me to move forward. I want to say to my friends, my family, my fans, thank you for the support. That was UFC fighter Conor McGregor after pleading guilty today to disorderly conduct. He was facing multiple charges after a brawl earlier this year at a New York arena. With today's plea, he avoids jail time, but he has to undergo anger management treatment and complete five days of community service. Bit of a rocky start this week to a European soccer club's first ever joint tour by their men's and women's teams. After it emerged, only the men got to fly in business class. Fans of FC Barcelona's women's team criticized the club online after photos showed the female players in economy. The club says it was a logistical issue, that the flight was booked before it was decided that the women's team would join, and not enough business seats were available. Two years ago this month, the Supreme Court of Canada implemented the Jordan decision, a ruling intended to improve access to speedy trials, a key plank in the criminal code. 
Instead, it has caused severely strained resources, grinding parts of the system to a near halt. Tonight, we'll look at that impact, starting with our Rob Antle, who explores how the ruling, in conjunction with recent decisions by the RCMP, created a whole new problem getting to trial. As a longtime defense lawyer and former federal prosecutor, Adam Stephen Bonney has seen the justice system from both sides. But he's never seen it under pressure the way it is now. The Supreme Court of Canada made it clear, the culture of complacency is dead. It's over. In the Jordan decision two years ago, the top court set strict timelines for the right to a speedy trial. But there's work to do before those cases get to court. And it's taking longer and longer for RCMP labs to process firearms forensic reports. For the uh, prosecutor, it creates uh, an you know, untenable state of affairs. For the accused, especially those who are innocent, it's completely unacceptable. Many police forces across the country rely on the RCMP to do work like this. Testing guns, analyzing bullets. And RCMP statistics show the results are slower to arrive. Four years ago, routine firearms testing took about 56 days. In the past year, that number had ballooned to 238 days. Behind me here in Ottawa, the RCMP operates one of its three labs. A few years back, it closed three others, a decision that had a cascading effect. Some specialized staff decided not to relocate, creating a resource crisis that's been felt in the courtroom. When the lab comes back and, and tells me that they have 230 days turnaround time uh, to get a report back on a gun, that's an enormous problem for us. Crown Prosecutor Rick Woodburn surveyed colleagues across Canada, and the news is not good. From reports that I'm getting across the country, uh, charges are being uh, stayed, uh, charges are, are being reduced, uh, and sometimes even uh, withdrawn by prosecutors uh, because of the delays uh, in getting those reports back. In one Newfoundland murder trial, a preliminary inquiry ground to a halt for seven months, waiting for a gun testing report. And in Manitoba, delays in disclosing forensic results factored into a judge's decision to throw out weapons charges. The good news is the Mounties now believe they are turning the corner. Lab jobs may soon be filled and turnaround times have gone down in recent months. All this as new stats show that gun violence in Canada is still on the rise. Rob Antle, CBC News, Ottawa. Now here's a little more on those rates of gun violence Rob mentioned. According to Statistics Canada, they are up across the country. StatsCan recorded more than 2,700 violent gun crimes last year. That's up more than 7% from 2016. The biggest spike was in Saskatchewan, with a jump of almost 50%. Ontario was second at 10%. Homicides committed with a gun are also up. According to the most recent numbers, there were 223 firearm-related homicides in 2016, more than half related to gang activity, mostly in Toronto and Vancouver. Now, earlier, Rob examined the effects of the Jordan decision on criminal law, but that's only one part of the system. Back in March, our Carolyn Dunn looked at how the ruling was affecting civil law as well by effectively robbing Peter to pay Paul. In a wooded lot a half hour north of Edmonton, Sandra Paraderi is living a life more rustic than she ever could have imagined. Firewood for heat from a wood stove. And no running water, no. No, no, no running water, uh, no electricity. Paraderi's common law husband died four years ago, but there's a legal battle over the estate. She can't get her rightful share until it's settled. She's broke, living mainly on a survivor's pension and the goodwill of others. Her lawyer says if that case goes to trial, it probably won't be scheduled before 2021. I get it. I got to start over, but I didn't think I was going to have to start over from under the barrel, not even the bottom. It's twisted. Hers is one of an untold number of civil cases facing lengthy delays, systemic delays that in some jurisdictions seem to grow only longer with each passing month. Part of the problem comes courtesy of the Supreme Court of Canada in what's known as the Jordan decision of July 2016. It ruled criminal trials must be completed within 18 months for relatively minor cases or 30 months for more serious offences. The system is straining to meet those deadlines and in some provinces they're using civil court resources to do it. 
Recently retired Chief Justice of Alberta Neil Whitman says the civil court system is suffering as a result. You cannot keep up the pace that this court is uh, presently being subjected to uh, for long periods of time and uh, get the quality of justice that I think the public deserves. In Calgary, for example, the wait for a civil trial in 2016 averaged 92 weeks. This year, that wait has doubled. Alberta is perhaps least prepared to deal with all of this because the federal government has failed to fill a dozen judicial vacancies. Maybe one of those positions has been filled so far. Maybe one. Mark Feehan is president of the Alberta Civil Trial Lawyers Association and Sandra Paradary's lawyer. You don't want alleged murderers walking the streets. Um, and we all understand that. Um, <clears throat> but the people that have non or less serious like family law or estate arguments or personal injury, they all just kind of got put on the back burner. The people like me, well, I don't even think we're on the back burner. I think we've been put on the side to cool. Where she counts the days, waiting for justice. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, near Edmonton. Next on The National, he's a movie star in Hollywood. Now Vancouver's Seth Rogen is about to get an unusual role in Hollywood North. Hey Vancouver, it's Seth. Here's a tip to make your transit ride even more awesome. I know your bag is probably very nice and you care deeply for it, but that doesn't mean it needs its own seat. I do. That is Rogan with some pictures of Vancouver SkyTrain. The campaign to get his voice on TransLink is our moment of the day. But first, we want to show you a piece of a story that we're bringing you on Monday night on The National. Here's Chris O'Neill Yates with a preview of a town that's gone to great lengths to make everyone feel welcome. Basque, population less than 4,000, located on the southwest tip of Newfoundland. Again? Yes. Somehow, though, this place has figured out enough to be labeled Canada's most autism-friendly town. Oh, well, hello there. The credit goes to some very committed parents and a very accepting community. There's a lot of isolation that comes with a diagnosis of autism. So when you have this community that rallies around you, it feels great. Joan Sheshon heads the town's group, Autism Includes Me. She's made it a priority to integrate the town's autistic kids with the whole community. We work in partnership with everyone. We don't feel like we're a secluded group of autism. And I think this is why we're getting so much support from the public. The result has made kids with autism feel just like everyone else. Sometimes in other places, you could get bullied for what you're doing. You could get made fun of, get called names. In Port of Bass, right here, it's not like that. We, wherever you go, you, you see friends. That's coming soon on The National. And a reminder that The National today takes you inside our journalism every afternoon. That's our newsletter. It goes deeper on the top stories and highlights the stories that you may have missed. Today, an official end to the Korean War signals of a peace agreement between North and South. Subscribe to our newsletter at cbcnews.ca slash The National. Celebrate summer with the CBC TV app. You know what, let's sit over there. Whether you're in the great outdoors. We're at the cottage. On an urban getaway. A little bit. A little bit. Or a staycation. On your box. Get set. Hey. Stream hundreds of shows anytime. Perfect. For free. I love looking out at the horizon and imagining all the possibilities. So take CBC on all your summer adventures. This is amazing. What the hell? With the CBC TV app. Johnny's back. Foo foo. Yeah, foo foo. I was like, who's foo foo? Lots of laughs. My cheeks are sore. Loyal fans. He was off the floral Richter right scale. Can't get enough. I do not look like that. Johnny Suja. Good job, Johnny. More like Benny Hula. Crazy. <laughs> okay. Still crazy. Still standing. Awesome. I don't know how he does that. Thanks so much. Still standing. Return September 18th on CBC. Part of the Tuesday night comedy lineup. Put a bird on it. Whitely, Whitely. Yeah! Time of my life! <laughs> hey, Vancouver, it's Seth. Here's a tip to make your transit ride even more awesome. 
Well, that will soon be burned into Vancouver commuters' brains. Today, TransLink, in charge of the city's public transit, announced hometown boy Seth Rogen as the new voice of public service announcements. His deep baritone and the story of how he got the new gig is our moment of the day. When I found out, I was very excited and I jumped on my phone. I started writing up the web hit, the story, on my phone while sitting on a bus and sending it into the newsroom. You can thank reporter Stephanie Ipp for what you'll soon hear on Vancouver's trains. I know your bag is probably very nice and you care deeply for it, but that doesn't mean it needs its own seat. The voice was supposed to be Morgan Freeman as part of a visa campaign, a plan Ipp and some others found a little puzzling. After that first story came out back in May, there were a lot of people that emailed me and asked what there wasn't a Canadian actor that could have done it, um, there wasn't somebody local that we could have hired instead. Uh, and my first thought was Seth Rogen. So she fired off a funny tweet, and soon after, sexual harassment allegations came out against Freeman, and TransLink dropped him. Ip's tweet turned into a hit-me-up from Rogan, and, well, TransLink did. Sometimes I think it feels like you're just yelling into the void, and it was fun this time to throw something out there and have people respond to it as well as they did. Any opportunity to enrich the lives of the Canadian people is an opportunity I will take. <laughs> those are very nice sneakers, but it's kind of a horror show on the soul. So get those feet off the seat. My mom might be sitting there one day. Come on. So I take the Canada line when I'm back in Vancouver, and I hope that his announcements are on there when I get back next. And, and you know, Andrew, we're a country famous for comedy, so what about Brent Butt and Russell Peters and Martin Short on other transit systems? I hope this becomes a trend. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you what I hope. I mean, and, and this is as someone who does take public transit to work every day. I hope that that, that laugh that, yeah. that I, I, I find, I mean, it's, it's wonderfully endearing. It is unique. I, I hope it doesn't slowly drive me insane oh, okay. after hearing it for the 6,000th time. I, mean, I have an open mind. We'll see. Uh, I don't know. But uh, time will tell. <laughs> I, wish, I wish I could do the laugh now. That would have been the perfect time. But impersonations are not my thing. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll cross my fingers. One can only hope. That seems to be the theme for the night. Uh, that is the national for this July 26th. Have a good night. Good night.